For the next several weeks, we will be in Matthew chapter 6, as we are in now week 2 of our series of studies on prayer. And for the next several weeks, we'll be looking at Jesus teaching us on prayer. You remember last week we began with Luke 11, 1, the disciples saying, Lord, teach us to pray. So put a mark, bookmark at, on your Bible app or stick a bulletin or a piece of paper in your uh, physical Bible to Matthew 6. We will be there for the next several weeks. <laughs> Jesus begins, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Have you ever been an outsider at an event, you know, one of those times where everybody seemed to know what was going on except you, <laughs> and you, you wondered if maybe you were in the wrong place. Everybody seemed to know, you know, the secret handshake and the code words and the inside jokes, and somebody would say two words and everybody would crack up laughing except you. You had no idea what was going on. Maybe that's the way you felt the first time you were in church. You know, I don't know the language. I don't know the inside jokes. I don't know any of this. And, and one of the things that we try to do here at Open Door is to look at church things through the eyes of people who aren't church people. And, and when you think about that as it relates to prayer, we church people do some strange things in the area of prayer. Now, I realize that my sermons are impacted by how I was raised and the church that I grew up in. So maybe none of this applies to you. Maybe some of you will identify with some of these weird things that church people do in the area of prayer. One is we don't think that God hears us unless we say, dear God, you know, or, or some other form of salutation. And, and some churches have a, a, a ritual or routine that they take prayer requests and then they just repeat everything that was just said in prayer. Uh, one year we were on vacation and we went to a church and they had a list of prayer requests in the weekly program. And then the preacher, since apparently nobody in that congregation could read, the preacher got out the program and read that list of requests to the people. I was in one church where not only did they have it in the program and the preacher read it, they projected it on the screen. And then they called on somebody to pray, but he forgot his list. And so he started praying. This is the truth. And then he said, God, there are too many to remember. And I wonder if God didn't say, that's okay, I saw it in the program, I saw it on the screen, I heard the preacher say, I know what you're praying for. You know? Sometimes we use a different voice. I don't know if you've ever been in a churches where they used a different voice when they started to pray. They just carry on a normal conversation, but when they start to pray, preachers do it sometimes when they start to preach. All of a sudden they start preaching and they get loud and, and all that, but sometimes we do it in prayer. Sometimes it's like we think there's a holy voice, you know, that we have to use when we pray. And, and I've been in meetings like that where I've heard somebody pray, and I had no idea who it was because I didn't recognize the voice. <laughs> True story. In one of the churches I pastored, 
My secretary came in one day and said, Pastor Ken, you won't believe what happened last night. So my daughter and I were having our family prayer at the end of the day, getting ready for bed. And usually I pray first. But last night, and she named her daughter, said that she wanted to pray first. And so I said, okay. She said, and Pastor Ken, she said, dear Jesus. I thought, what in the world is happening? And then she said, it was my turn to pray. And you know what I heard myself do? Dear Jesus. She said, I realized my daughter was just imitating the way I was praying. And I thought, oh my, that's how I sound when I pray. You know, sometimes we think we've got to have a holy voice somehow, you know, when we pray. We use different words. Somehow we think God might be impressed by our vocabulary. And you've probably heard people pray like that. Oh God, you are omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent and all the other omnis. You know, Lord, you are the God of Rehoboam and Jeroboam and, and the whole Boam family. You know, and it's like, who are you trying to impress? We, we use different language, you know, and I'm not talking about what they call a prayer language. I'm talking about 1611 language. You know, when we pray, we think we've got to use 1611. We think we've got to use the thou and we think we've got to use the ESTs at the end of the words. And if you grew up in, if you didn't grow up in a church like that, I am so thankful because you didn't have to unlearn anything. But if you grew up in a church like that, you know how much that's ingrained in you. <laughs> I had a, a good friend who did not have a church background, but through the influence of uh, my dad, actually, he and his father came to faith and grew up you know, started attending one of those kind of thou est's churches. And one day uh, they asked him, my buddy, to lead in prayer. And he wasn't quite sure where the ESTs went. And so he says, Lord, we pray that thou wouldest help us. And it's like, no, no, no. You don't have to add EST to the end of your words to pray. And then one that I think most people, every parent is guilty of this is praying to people instead of God. You know, you're sitting around the supper table. It's big, you know, a big holiday. All the kids are in. And mama's praying, or daddy's praying, God, help my children sitting around this table to know how much I've sacrificed for them and to know that it's not right that they take me for granted. Let them know they're about to kill me and one day when I'm gone, they're going to be sorry they treated me so mean. In Jesus' name, amen, right? You know, Preachers are good at this. Preachers know how to pray announcements. Dear Lord, we pray for the ladies' Bible study. Please remind them that though they were supposed to meet at 7 o'clock on Tuesday night, they're meeting at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning at Linda's house. And Lord, please remind them to bring a covered dish for the lunch. Amen. You know, we just prayed an announcement. I, I challenge you, you start going to other churches and listen how many times those things happen. And if we're not careful, we pray to impress other people. If you've ever been involved in a, in a small group and people prayed around the circle, oh, that's frightening. Because if you're the last person in the circle, somebody else has done prayed all the good stuff, you know? And, and you're desperately trying to figure out, how can I impress these people? And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gives us some basic principles about prayer. The first thing he says is, verse 5, when you pray. He says the same thing in verse 6. When you pray. God expects us to pray. If those were the only two verses in the Bible about prayer, they would be enough to tell us to pray. God expects us to pray. He does not say, if you find yourself in a bind and you can't figure out anything at all what to do, it's okay if you pray. He didn't say if you pray. He said when you pray. God expects his children to to pray. You're not bothering him when you pray. You're not irritating him when you pray. He expects you to pray when you pray. And I, I wondered why. 
And, and just immediately, 2 Chronicles 7.14 came to my mind. <clears throat> now, you know that verse. It's the verse that we use every God and country day. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sins, heal their lands. But I want you to pull out two very important subject verb phrases. If my people pray, I will hear. That's massive. If we pray, God hears. No wonder Jesus said, when you pray. He said, you're too intelligent to miss out on an opportunity like this. If you pray, God hears. That means that at least one of the ways I can communicate with God is through prayer. And since the rest of that verse said he'll hear and answer, then at least one of the ways God communicates to me is through prayer. And so when you pray, God expects us to pray. If we pray, God hears. Please get a hold of that. You're not wasting air when you pray. You're not wasting breath when you pray. When you pray, God hears. That's incredible. I, I, I've mentioned several times, I think, in the last couple of months, I don't even want to imagine a world where we couldn't pray and know that God was listening to us. Because life is too hard. I don't know about you. I can't do it by myself. And it's good to know that when I pray, God hears. But as we mentioned a little bit ago, don't pray to impress people. He said, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to be on the street corners and the synagogues. and he, That's why I read the first few verses of Matthew 6, because he talked about when you do your deeds of righteousness, don't do it to be seen of people. In the first century, there were people who did their acts of righteousness, giving to the poor, praying, to be seen of people. And the wealthier ones literally hired people that played trumpets to go with them. And if there was a street corner where there was a poor person begging, that rich person would come up with his trumpeters and they would blow their trumpets. And when everybody looked to see what the commotion about, with a great flourish, the wealthy person would pull out their money and give it to the poor. Jesus said, that's your reward. People saw you do it. Don't expect any reward in heaven. And they did the same thing when they prayed. They would stand in a very visible place in the synagogue or they would stand on the street corners and make a show out of their praying. Jesus said, don't pray to impress people. He said, if you impress people with your prayers, that's the reward you're going to get. Then he says something that's a little challenging for us in verse 6. When you pray, go to your room and close the door. In other words, have a quiet place to pray. I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. If you've ever done any study on how to study, you know, maybe you had a, a test that you had to take at work or there was some course that you needed to pass for a certification and it had been a long time since you've been in school and it's like, man, I don't even remember how to study you probably ran across the idea that to more effectively study, you need a designated, dedicated place where all you do is study. It, it, it might be a desk, it might be an end table, it might be you know a part of the kitchen, it might be something, but it's a place where when you sit down there, you're not sitting there to eat, you're not sitting there to get on Facebook, you're not sitting there to play a game on your device, you're only there to study. And if you have a dedicated, designated place like that, when you sit down there, your whole system says, we're here to study. That's a, that's a pretty good principle. Maybe your family has the same place where you go every year on vacation. When you walk into that place, it's like, ah, your whole body knows I'm on vacation. Jesus said you need to have a specific place 
where you can shut out the distractions and pray. Now, immediately we run into what I warned you about last week. That in this mystery of prayer, there are statements that the scripture makes that seem to contradict each other. Pray without ceasing, <laughs> and go in your room and shut the door and pray. And again, I told you the answer is both. There are, yes, God wants us to pray all the time. And if you drive on Washington Road or I-20, you probably pray pretty much all the time. But he also knows that there are times when we need to have a designated place because we've got some serious prayer to do. You understand what I'm talking about? You know, you're facing a major life decision and you need to know wisdom from God. You don't need to be around distractions. You don't need to be driving down the highway. You need to have a, a place where you, you just say, okay, God, I'm here to do business with you. I'm here because I need to get some insight from you. So I'm going to open my Bible. I'm going to read. I'm going to ask you to give me direction. I'm going to take notes from what comes into my mind I, because this is something I can't afford to get wrong. Have that kind of a place. You know, Donna and I, pretty much any, any week that we want to, we go like to Cracker Barrel and eat. But if we have a serious discussion that we need to have about something, we don't go to Cracker Barrel. Sorry, Cracker Barrel, but, you know, you got people sitting six inches from you on either side having their meals. You know, you, you can't have a serious conversation in an environment like that. And yes, you can pray in the midst of your daily routine, but there's some times where you need Jesus said to just get apart for a while and say, God, I need some answers here. This is, this is more than just, you know, help me get through my day. This is, this is life altering and I need to know your will. And, and just let me kind of do a parenthesis here and talk to you a little bit about how to set the atmosphere when you're going in your room to that place and shutting the door. And, and that place, you know, I, the context of this verse is he's saying don't make a show of it. Rather be private. I don't think he's necessarily saying you need to go to a room that has a door and shut the door. I don't know of any record of Jesus praying like that. He prayed in the mountains. He prayed on the seashore. You know, he prayed in a boat. Um, but, but what he's saying is get the distractions out of the way. And there's some things that help set an atmosphere. Music is important in setting an atmosphere. When, when I sit down at my study... And I know that I'm going to have a block here of three or four hours where I'm going to be doing some serious you know, Bible study and sermon preparation. There's two or three different playlists, depending on what I feel I need that day, that I play. And as soon as that music hits, my whole system says, time to go to work. Donna will tell you that on my way into church every Sunday morning, there's six or eight different songs that, again, depending on what I feel I need, I'm going to play when we come in and she'll say you're playing that again yeah that's my Sunday morning song you know uh, it, it, it prepares me it's time for church and and so it may be that especially if you are a musician or you like music or you relate to music that you ought to get however you get your music you know whether it's a streaming service or whatever it is and make yourself a couple of playlists that have songs in it that draw your attention to God. And as you begin your time with him, put that music on and let it prepare your spirit, let it prepare the atmosphere to continue to talk to God. Some people like nature. There was a lady uh, that, that we know who's in our family actually, whose house is on a river. And she's told me several times, that she starts her day out on her back porch with her cup of coffee, looking at the river and praying. You know, it's the, the you know, if you like maybe taking a walk or whatever. It may be that you've got a chair on your back porch or a swing on a tree. or But when you get out in nature, it calms you, it soothes you, it draws your attention uh, to God, and it helps prepare the atmosphere for praying. Some people are artistic. I'm not. But I, I know people who probably 
draw their prayers. You know, they 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 can draw something that is expressing their heart that they can't put into words. And don't overlook scripture. We've talked about scripture. Don't overlook scripture. Uh, it, it's not read your Bible or pray. It's it's do them both. And I think that typically most of our practice would tell us that as we're reading the scripture, it drives us to prayer. As we read the scriptures, oh God, I need some help here. You know, help me understand how to do this. Give me the courage to do this. Um, and, and so, have a, a, of a quiet place. It, it maybe you don't have a room you said you can designate, but maybe there's a chair in the corner of the house, or like we said, a, you know, a rocking chair on the back porch, or something that when you go there, you know, I'm here to pray. I, I heard one person say that they had a little corner of their house, a uh, little corner of one of the rooms, and it had a little table in it, and that's where they had their Bible, and that they had actually made a crown of thorns and put it there as some, kind of a symbol to remind them, I'm here to pray to Jesus who loved me enough that he was willing to die for me. So wh whatever it is, Jesus is saying, yes, pray through your day, but then... There are times when you need to go to a room somewhere and close the door and just get your whole spirit ready to pray. doesn't have to be a fancy place. You may know the name John Wesley. You may know the name Charles Wesley. Their mother's name was Susanna. She had 15 other children besides John and Charles. And there was a corner chair in her room that when she sat in that chair, and she, you know how women in those days wore aprons, she pulled her apron up over her head. Her children know she was praying, don't bother her. Find a place to pray. And again, that doesn't mean you don't pray at other times. Um, you've heard me mention, and I'll mention him more in this series, Brother Lawrence in his book, The Practice of the Presence of God. And he basically said, the time of business is no different than the time of prayer with me. He was a cook and a kitchen helper and wash the dishes in the monastery. And he said, in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, while several people are calling at the same time for different things, I possess God the same way as if I were on my knees. Wow, <laughs> there's something to aspire to. But there are times when you just need to get by yourself, Somewhere, I, I think if Jesus were teaching us today, he would say, go somewhere and silence your phone, you know, and, and just focus on me. The next thing he says is verse 7. When you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. God is not impressed with lots of words. This again, is one of those both ands. Because as we said last week, Jesus also said, ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, and knock and keep on knocking. And now he's saying, God's not impressed with lots of words. My mind went to 1 Kings chapter 18. It's Elijah on Mount Carmel. Remember when he's challenged the prophets of Baal? Whichever God answers by fire will know he's the real God. And the false prophets pray from morning till evening. They scream, they shout, they gyrate, they get serious enough that they start cutting themselves. And then in verses 36 and 37, Elijah said, okay, it's my turn. And depending on the translation you have, it's about 60 words. You can pray it in about 30 seconds. And fire fell. <laughs> God's not impressed with lots of words. It's almost as if he's saying, I'm not more likely to answer you if you ask me 40 times or if you just ask me a couple of times. Because it's not how many words you say or how long you pray, it's your faith. And sometimes we have to ask and keep asking and see, can keep seeking and knock and keep knocking because our faith needs to be built and grown. I was thinking about that and how I pray. And there's a lot of times when I pray with lots of words. And yeah, I was telling Donna the other day, as I get older, I think some of the thing, reasons I do the things I do is because of my OCD. You know, it's like 
Oh no, I didn't pray that sentence. And if I don't pray that sentence today that I prayed yesterday, then God might not hear me, you know? And, and, and that's not what, you know, Jesus is teaching us. But sometimes we think we've got to use lots of words. These are not specific prayers I've prayed, but there have been the attitudes of the prayers I've prayed. Some of you remember our history with automobiles, and there were times in our lives where my prayers could have been, Lord, you, it sure seems like we need a different vehicle. You know, this thing has died in the middle of the road on me three times in the last month. I can't get it started half the time. The road service person and I am on first name basis. I'm paying the mechanic as much money as I would pray, pay for a new car payment. And Lord, and it was almost like studying this Lord said, you know, I know all that stuff. You don't have to give me all the details. I know the details. I know more about the details than you do. <laughs> you, you could pray, pray, Lord, you know my need for transportation. Answer my prayer, please. Give me wisdom to know what to do. I'm not more apt to answer your prayer for transportation if you give me a diary of everything that's happened to this car. But, but somehow we, we think that God needs to know these things. And, and I'm trying, I mean, this week I've been trying to work on that. You know, you know, it's just not fair when the Lord preaches his own sermon to a preacher. You know, but, but you, know, try to, you know, you don't need to you know, go through this whole list. God knows. You don't need to give him all of the options and all the alternatives. We do that for us, you know, to help clarify in our mind. But he's not impressed with lots of words. It's our faith, not how many words we use. And then he really gets tough on verse 8. Don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. What he's saying in a very gentle way is don't spend so much time on your needs. Oh, that's what most of my praying is my needs Lord I, I need this from you today and I know Donna's going through this give her this help and Kimberly needs help with this and Brian needs help with this and Victoria needs help with this and please help my dad with this and my sister with this and and our church needs this and this family in the church needs this and if I'm not supposed to pray about my needs what am I supposed to talk about when I go in the closet and close the door? I won't be in there very long. By the way, the next several weeks we'll be answering the question on, on what to pray if you're not going to stay so focused on your needs. Now please hear me. Jesus is not saying, nor am I saying, you should not pray about your needs. There are too many verses all through Scripture and too many examples all through Scripture of people praying about what they need. How many times did Jesus ask, what do you want me to do for you? How many times do we read, pour out your heart to God? Bring our needs to him. But what Jesus is setting us up for in this verse, it's almost like a preliminary statement to what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer, which is really the disciples' prayer. He's saying, don't spend all your time about your needs because prayer is so much more than that. Prayer is about God. Prayer is about His kingdom. Prayer is about His will. Prayer is about His cause around the world, not just your needs. That's tough. <laughs> but again, over the next few weeks, we'll, we'll learn how Je Jesus never says, don't pray about your needs. He's just saying, when you pray, don't go on and on and on about them. And then he throws in this kicker because your father knows what you need before you ask him. And all of a sudden, this question popped into my mind. Does Jesus know I need this? I got very uncomfortable. 
Because when I pray about things that I think I need, does God think I need it? <laughs> does God know I need it? I'm convinced that over the years of my life, I've prayed for a lot of things that I didn't need. Thought I did. But God knew I needed something different or something better. So, <laughs> kind of ask yourself, that is, okay, I'm getting ready to pray. Does God know about this? Does he know that I need this? He, again, he's not saying, don't ask for what you need. What he is saying is, you don't have to go on and on and on about it, because if it is truly a need, your father knows about it. And he will answer it. Let him supply our needs. That's, I'm just going to leave that with you and let you wrestle with it in your own spirit. Pray for what you need, absolutely. But don't let that be the extent of your praying. Prayer is so much more for that than that. And then he says in verse 6 that when you pray, your Father will reward you for praying. That's an encouragement. God rewards us for praying. He sees you in the secret place and he will reward you. Now you know he's not talking about material possessions. But if you will talk to people who have a consistent prayer life and have had a consistent prayer life for time, they will tell you that the greatest reward of praying is the developing of of their relationship with God. I know God better. I know Him in a different way. The Bible is richer. My relationship with God is more intimate because I've prayed. That's the reward of praying. A closer relationship with God. So I want to give you a couple of practical action steps and then I want to quote you from one of the classics on prayer. Listen to yourself pray. And, and by the way, a lot of people suggest that you pray out loud when you pray, you know, assuming you're in your closet somewhere, you know, because it helps keep you focused. You know that if you, you know, God knows our thoughts and you can think pray, but, but sometimes you think pray and that thought reminds you of this, which reminds you of that, which reminds you of that, and before long you're not praying. And, and so some people say, you know, speak out loud. But, but if you pray in public, you know, you're asked to pray somewhere, just listen to yourself pray. Are you praying to God or are you praying to people? And then I would just encourage you to, to think about where in your environment you can designate a place that's for prayer. Maybe not exclusively, maybe you don't have that much room, but at least predominantly. So that when you go to that chair or you go to that spot on your porch or in your backyard, you know I'm here to talk to God. It, it might enrich your relationship with Him. Andrew Murray wrote a book that has become maybe the classic on prayer and it's called with christ in the school of prayer and he has a chapter on luke 11 1 where we began last week lord teach us to pray and i want to read you some excerpts from that chapter lord teach us to pray yes to pray this is what we need to be taught though in its beginnings prayer is so simple that the feeblest child can pray Yet at the same time, it's the highest and holiest work we can accomplish. Prayer is the channel of all blessings and the secret of power and life. And this hit me. It is not only for ourselves, but for others and the church and for the world that God has given the right to pray and take hold of his strength. Yes, we feel the need to be taught to pray. At first, there's no work that appears so simple. Later, no work that is more difficult. And the confession is forced from us. We don't know how to pray as we ought. 
Lord, teach us to pray. Yes, us, Lord. We offer ourselves as learners. We want to be taught by you. Lord, teach us to pray. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for tuning in wherever you're tuning in. God bless you.